So, uh, I, uh, Teofilo Falengo's Baldus uh, was originally published in Venice in 1517. The Benedictine monk's mock chivalric epic, composed pseudonymously under the name Merlin Cocaille, is deemed one of the major literary sources of François Rabelais' works. The tale narrates in macaronic exometers the deeds of a vulgar ruffian, Baldo, and his miscreant band of friends as they ramble through Italy, the chief province of the world, and travel on the high seas to the nether regions of the earth. My paper ventures to suggest that the geographical imaginary of Renaissance travel and reading practices were tightly interwoven as most cosmographical and geographical subject matter drew inevitably on visual thinking. As the humanist scholar Justus Lipsius claims, one, I quote, could further and increase his learning by peregrination or traveling by the eye, which is either by reading these books or by being an eyewitness of the very same things which he hath read in books. Thus, like the traveler walking through strange and foreign landscapes, the movement of the reader's eye will explore the text which slowly merges into a map, deploying itself before the reader's gaze as he wades through the confines of the Falengian text. The purpose of this study is to show how, in his Liber Macaronicus, our Mantuan poet lulls the reader into a satirical and subversive cosmography using cartographic metaphors and conventions to create, and <clears throat> to create sorry, a world in which geographical and choreographical reality and fiction mingle. I will then uh, afterwards try and shed light on the way in which Falengo subverts the conventions of travel literature. In the wake of the recent discoveries, uh, the geographical discoveries, the second half of the 15th century witnessed, as Francesca Fiorani points out, a proliferation of maps on walls in Italy, a trend which developed throughout the 16th and 17th centuries. Unfortunately, most of these mural maps have disappeared and are known only through documents describing them such as the maps painted for the Gonzaga palaces in Mantua. This trend was also driven by the growing interest in geography, which had been triggered by the rediscovery of Greek texts such as Strabo's geography, as well as the revival of Claudius Ptolemy's Liber Geographicae, which was printed many times from 1475 onwards, and which played a central part in the new cosmographical discourse. We may therefore assume that this intellectual and cultural background contributed to the shaping of geographical knowledge while also providing pictorial images of the world for the Renaissance readers. In the opening lines of his geography, Ptolemy notes that, I quote, world cartography is an imitation through drawing. Conversely, we may envisage the text as an imitation of the map through descriptio. Moreover, equating maps with texts raises the question of the reader's imagination. The written text can be therefore viewed as the representation of a map, and the world depicted in Falengo's book would therefore seem familiar to his learned readers of the early modern Republic of Letters who shared his intellectual and cultural background. The repetitive viewing of these mural uh, maps was, as the cosmographers note, a prerequisite to remember and visualize the oikumene. Consequently, the mnemonic function of maps helped structure the Renaissance reader's knowledge and perception of space. The essence of Renaissance literature was to imitate inherited and recuperated material from classical literature, and Falengo's Baldus is no exception to this rule. Falengo obviously wrote for his fellow humanist readers who were able to understand the erudite references, whether geographical or classical, which he sprinkled in his motley text. As I hope to show in this paper, Falengo's work subsumes a number of themes related to travel literature, as well as to the works of cosmographers such as Apian, Munster, and Ortelius. I therefore wish to shed light on the paradoxical nature of our poet's work, which not only subverts the codes of geographical and travel literature creating a Goliardic farce, but also presents the reader with a virulent critique of his epoch. The opening cantos of Baldus offers the reader a tabula geographica of Italy. Baldo's parents, Guido and Baldovina, have fled France and crossed the Alps, entering the happy country of Italy. The reader's eye is immediately directed through the Italian peninsula. 
I quote, at length they arrived on the Lombard Plain. They pass through Milan and the countryside of Reggio and enter the noble city called Mantua. They make entrance through the gate called Porta Leona. But, on recognizing Sordello, a former brother in arms, Guido and Baldovina leave the city of Mantua and arrive in the immense village of Sipada, which is located only a mile away from Mantua. The structure of Falengo's Descriptio conforms to the way in which cosmographers proceeded when depicting a country and is reminiscent of the way in which Ortelius guides the reader's eye over Europe. I quote, from hence we passed to Germany, we passed over the mountains into Italy, purposing also to view all the provinces thereof generally. From thence we crossed the sea and sailed into Greece. The compositional details of these landscapes enhance the realistic effect of the description. Falengo offers the disembodied viewer a view of the territory through which Baldo will soon be wandering. Having noted that Sipada is famed for breeding rogues, the author proceeds to give a detailed description of Italy, quotation number one. If this description offers, a, offers the reader a bird's eye view of Italy, the map he is beholding before his eyes also stand, stands also sorry, as a satirical map of Italy, which highlights the extreme variety of the Diver the, the extreme cultural diversity in Italy at the time. The precision of the topographical description in Canto 8 offers the reader a close-up miniature of Mantua's Contado. I quote, there is a place near Sipada, a thousand yards away, which, as the histories tell us, is called Motella, a village small in houses but vast in fields. Here, an old church, its walls in ruins. This description enhances the realistic effect of the author's choreographical portrayal of Italy, proceeding like the actual cosmographers who included detailed descriptions of various localities as they moved from an overall <coughs> picture to more detailed views of the country described. I'm thinking here more particularly of the work by Leandro Alberti, uh, Descrizione di tutta Italia, which was published in 50, 1550. Sorry. Let me consider for a moment Falengo's choreographical settings of Mantua, Sipada and Motella, which call special attention as to the way in which Falengo uses geographical and choreographical details in his narrative. All three are located be sorry, below the Lago de Garda. Bearing in mind Falengo's Mantuan origins, the choice of this region has, I believe, an importance within the narrative's setting, especially if we consider Ortelius's description of the region. Uh, you can't see it very well here, but the, I'll, I'll show it to you later, but the Monte Baldo is just a little bit above the lake, uh, but I'll show that, I'll come to that later. It's quotation number two, and I'll read just partly this quotation, because I think it's important. There is in this tract a very high mountain, which they call Baldo. Here, this hill is very well known to herbarists and apothecaries, which flock hither from all quarters, etc., etc. When reading this description, I was, ex I was immediately drawn back to the prefatory epistle of the 1517 and 1521 editions of Baldus, written by Aquarius Lodola, the imaginary editor of Merlin Coquay's text. Lodola claims not only to be a cosmographer, I quote, you know for a while how keen I am to go exploring the world and the various customs in the world, but also happens to be a herbalist who was navigating towards Armenia when a tempest threw him and his companions onto the shore of a mysterious island. My point here is that obviously Falengo had in mind Monte Baldo when he was writing uh, or depicting his Lodola's journey, and the second point is that considering the critical importance of onomastics in uh, Falengo's work, it seems reasonable to assume that Baldo owes his name to this mountain. If Falengo's work provides us with various cartographical views and references of Italy, he also uses the map or nautical chart as a metaphor to convey the sense of confusion and bewilderment which progressively overcomes Zambello, Baldo's half-brother, who loses his bearings as he navigates through the city of Mantua. 
One of the most remarkable features of the nautical charts used in the Renaissance was their precision as they were used to correct the established errors of cartography. Zambello has been dragged before the mayor by Tognazzo to witness against Baldo, who has not stopped, has spent his time mistreating his brother. Zambello's clumsiness leads him to trip over several times, creating greater confusion in the poor man's mind. Zambello says, n I quote, sorry, Zambello says nothing since the thoughts in his gourd are no less tangled than the lines on a nautical chart. Zambello, a peasant from Sipada, is unable to navigate within the urban setting of Mantua and the codified rules of the city are as cryptic to him as the complexity of the tangled lines drawn on nautical charts. Having fled Sipada and overcome all sorts of ordeals, Baldo and his companions arrive at the port of Chioga where they decide to leave for Turkey on board a ship and board a ship with 30 shepherds from Tessino who absolutely do not want to travel with the three rogues. Falengo's description of the boat leaving the port offers the reader a view of the coastal outlines of Venice as the three companions leave behind the relative safety of the coastal waters. <laughs> Quotation number three. The sea journey is suffused with navigational references which focus on the importance of astronomical navigation and constitute, to my mind, the cosmographical aspect of Falengo's work. As the first tempest ends, they land on a mysterious rock. The place is desolate and barren. Baldo and his companions explore the island and come to a dark grotto in which they discover an extraordinary working model of the universe whose complexity stupefies them. Quotation number four. While providing the reader with an alchemical uh, interpretation of the world, this passage, which echoes also the French mathematician and cartographer Orange Finet's mechanistic vision of the universe, it also gives the reader a precise description of the orological mechan mechanism of a spherical astrolabe. Here we are. This is taken from Tycho Brahe, the Danish astronomer's Astronomiae Instru Instoratae Mechanica, which was published in 1602. Just to give you the idea of an astrolabe, but you all know what an astrolabe is. Um, um, so I've lost myself in my in the meanders of my... Well, anyway, I'll find. Here I am. Uh, although this cannot be stated with certainty, we may uh, possibly conjecture that Falengo is referring here to the famed astrarium of Giovanni de Dondi, which was built in Padua between 1348 and 1364. Canto 14 opens with a description of the skies whose beauties deeply affect Baldo. Before such a sight, our hero shares his fascination with Singar, the rogue, and questions him on these wonders. Singar turns out to be a learned authority on astrology, as his following words attest to. Quotation number six. Singar's speech induces fits of laughter by Leonardo, who obviously mocks astrologers. Singar retorts by emphasizing the importance of the moon, which provides navigators with precious weather indications. Renaissance cosmographers, from Apian to Ortelius, stressed the importance of astronomy in the comprehension of our mundane world, and focused also on the importance of astronomy in um, navigation matters, uh, which is clearly underlined here by Simon Giraud in his book entitled Globe du Monde, quotation number seven. But Singar's astrological description of the heavens soon turns into a bawdy and ludicrous description of the planet's lewd behavior, quotation number eight. Falengo offers the reader his own Almagest in the shape of a satirical map of the celestial universe portraying a world where the gods behave like men. Astronomical phenomena had already been previously parodied in Canto 8 during the fight between Lena, Zambello's wife, and Berta, 
Baldo's wife, as Folengo provides the reader with a satirical picture of a solar eclipse. I quote, with her, Berta, with her feet sticking up in the air, she remains entangled with her hind quarters exposed. She blocks out the sun and contrary to nature, this moon outshines her husband. Lena does not waste time. She injects the hot distaff into the eclipse that has darkened the globe. As they travel towards hell, the narration clearly focuses on the porous boundaries between real and fictional realms, as the characters move imperceptibly from one world into another, which was not, of course, at the time surprising. As Jean-Marc Bess explains, the surface of the earth was, I quote, un lieu ou une ère de communication avec cet autre temps qu'est le temps de l'esprit. After having destroyed Gelfora's realm on their way down to hell, Baldo and his companions come across a city which the narrator compares to Venice. Quotation, sorry, I'm going there. Quotation number nine. In other words, hell, which is an isolated world, remains yet very much like our own mundane world, a world in which one gets lost in a maze of paths and streets which lead us, however, all to our finest, final destination, death. Moreover, Falengo's description of Venice bears a certain resemblance with the printed plan of Venice by Jacobo de Barberi, which was published in 1500. I shall not dwell here on the landscapes depicted as our heroes descend into hell. However, it is interesting to note that Falengo, like most cosmographers, I'm thinking here of Cunningham or Munster, locates hell in the bowels of the earth. Munster even mentions the presence of devils in certain mines. I quote Munster, the French edition, Il a été aussi trouvé qu'en aucune mine il conserve une espèce de diable. And the world inhabited by these creatures is a world of delusion, où les diables font ses illusions. Having examined Falengo's cosmography, I would like briefly now to uh, see the way in which the poet subverts the narrative conventions of travel literature. Travel literature was inherently part of cosmograph cosmographical and geographical science, and whether fictional or not, this literary genre was believed useful to provide the reader with geographical knowledge while also deemed a means of self-discovery. Travel literature rested on the essential paradigm of first-hand observation and focused on the credibility and authority of the traveller as a direct witness. The plea for autopsy was a key to the efficiency of the message. The author's discursive construction reifies what the readers cannot see as he guides them on their eye travel through the, uh, an imaginary itinerary. The book I used here as a kind of uh, theoretical frame is, was published in 1574, that is 22 years after the Visago Cocayo edition of Baldus, which I'm using here. Uh, it was, it was uh, written by Hieronymus Turler, Turler and it, was entitled, it is entitled De Peregrinazione Agro Neapolitano. Uh, the book discusses the art of traveling in detail and proposes, I believe, a rather reliable theoretical framework on the way in which travel literature was perceived in Renaissance. Falengo's tales, uh, tale, sorry, pertains to the canons of the utopian travel genre. A group of companions from all walks of life overcome numeral obstacles, monsters, witches and devils. The narrative offers also a descriptive itinerary for the would-be reader traveller uh, as the peripatetic peripatetic, sorry, narrative unfolds. The final chapter of these peregrinations implies the return of the traveller to the known world not returning would render the whole travel meaningless. While being an essential aspect in fictional narratives, it is also essential to non-fictional narratives, such as the memoirs of the Spanish conquistador Bernal Diaz del Castillo, the true history of the conquest of New Spain. From the outset, Falengo subverts the conventions of travel literature as he plays on the popular view sorry, of travellers' bad reputation and their inability to stay put. Unrest characterises Baldo from a very early age on. 
The little devil gallops here and there. He can't stand still. Travellers were also viewed as dissemblers who disrupt society in the same way Baldo and his band of friends wreck havoc wherever they go, even in hell, where they destroy Gelfora's realm after having shred thousands of bodies into pieces and dispatched a countless number of heads up to the stars. Paradoxically, Falengo does not subvert the didactical aspect of travel literature, which was the genre's main characteristic. Travelling was viewed as a means of discovering the transient nature of all things and a way of awakening the reader's mind to the allurements of sundry pleasures. During his peregrinations, Baldo is made aware of his fate. And as the didactic dimension of travel literature surfaces, it lets the reader know that there is obviously more to Baldo's tale than may be surmised. Moreover, by throwing light on the surrealistic feats of Baldo and his companions, Falengo clearly purports the absurd dimension of his tale, and Baldo's journey will bring him to understand the madness of the world in a way reminiscent of that of Sebastian Brandt's Narrenschiff. Falengo's work seems to anticipate Ortelius's Theatrum, which presents the world as a stage ruled by madness. As Baldo's father tells him, I realized that the world is only a cage of fools. The latter remark brings to mind the latter remark brings to mind the famous so-called fool's head map, which portrays the world enclosed within a fool's head. This anonymous map was probably printed in, 15, in the 1590s in Antwerp and bears resemblance with the cordiform map published by Abraham Ortelius in 1564. While comparing this anonymous map Mundi with Ortelius's philosophical approach to geography, Jean-Marc Bess sheds light on the rather pessimistic message delivered by the Flemish cosmographer. I quote, La terre, I quote here Jean-Marc Bess, La terre est peuplée de fous au désir vain. Ce n'est pas un lieu pour vivre ni être heureux. This rather grim view of human existence is correlated in the final canto when Baldo and his companions are led from the cage of fools into a giant pumpkin by a fool. Thus, while focusing on the grotesque nature of human life, Falengo pinpoints man's miserable condition in a bleak and hostile world. This vision may probably be explained by the historical context in which Falengo, Falengo's work was produced. To conclude, I believe that there is sufficient textual and contextual evidence to throw light on Falengo's awareness of cartographical and cosmographical matters, as well as on his substantial geographical knowledge. Like the works of cosmographers such as Apian, Finet, Munster, Ortelius, and Mercator, Falengo's work was impelled by a graphic imperative. He used geographical and cartographical references and metaphors as spurs which enhanced the vividness of his fabled world, a world in which the verbal and visual interfere with one another as they fashion before the reader's eyes a geographical map mingling fantasy and reality. Consequently, Teofilo Falengo's work clearly corresponds to what Barbara Bowen terms a narratopedia, a subtle combination of narrative and encyclopedia, as the poet plows a virtually boundless field of classical and cosmographical knowledge. Having journeyed through the Falengian text, the reader, like Ulysses Dante in the Inferno, has become an expert in worldly matters, a mondo esperto. Thank you very much.